Alexis, you're up. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for um, registering for today's um, webinar. We're so excited to have you here. Um, so on your right hand side of your, um, you know, your desktop, you should see a control panel um, with polls and a handout drop down. Um, during this presentation, Debbie will be referring to the poll um, for answers, and there will also be two handouts there that you can download and view for yourself. Um, so please, um, you know, see that on your right hand side. And maybe the floor is yours. Alexis, did you cue me? Yes, she did. Yes? Yes. Okay. All right. I missed that last part. Uh, so excellent. Welcome, everybody, to our first Friday is what we're calling it. So our first Friday client uh, webinar, client chat, and we decided to expand it to friends and family because it occurred to me that we can actually invite friends and family to this. And um, a lot of you have talked to us in the past about, oh, you know, I wish you could meet my sister or my friend or my son who, you know, lives in this other state. And the, actually the sort of good news about some of what's going on now is it is forcing us to rethink things, rethink everything, and in certain respects, uh, broaden our scope, even though I'm sitting here working um, from my dining room as my new command center um, with my Mexican street art uh, behind me that I bought um, in um, the, the Playa, Playa, del, Playa del Mar, I forget. Anyway, that place in Mexico that's 30 minutes out of Cancun that seems so far away from here that I can't even think about how to pronounce it, and I bought this on the street, and um, and here this is where we're working. So even though I'm in my dining room, we're able to expand our scope to friends and family well beyond Ramsey or Franklin Lakes, New Jersey. So hello and and welcome. So this is our third client chat that we've done, and we've basically been getting about a quarter of our clients um, signing on, which is I think a huge number, um, particularly as that we're just you know starting this. So thank you for those who are repeat visitors. And for those who are here for the first time, again, welcome. So we have a ton of content to cover. As you know, I create these decks myself and I actually end up um, licensing and selling these decks to other advisors uh, through my work for Horses Mouth, um, which is all gated content. And so like, these are my slides, this is my deck. Um, and I know it like the back of my hand, which is good because yesterday we ended up uh, with the wrong deck on the screen. And as I was able to present it and not get tripped up because I create all these decks anyway. And so it's not too much of a problem for us. Um, and so let's see, I have you know, a bunch of notes here. So this is basically today my Uber deck. And what I mean by Uber deck is there's three different things that we can potentially cover. We're going to do it for an hour. And so we are going to break at, you know, 515 is, you know, my commitment to you, right? And so here are the three main areas of the deck. Because we're going to talk about the markets and the economy because there's so much happening that literally like every day um, you have basically a month's worth of news in a day. And so it's just been unbelievable how often I need to actually update these decks to make them relevant. And the folks that I work with um, on my side gig, uh, they actually have me update these decks weekly for them. And by the end of the week, they're completely out of date, which is why they have me updating them weekly. And so we have a section on the markets and the economy because I can't you know, really be talking about much else unless we cover what I consider to be the foundation, the basics, uh, and to go through that. And then the second part of the deck is the government stimulation, uh, stimulation, listen to me, the stimulus, <laughs> the government stimulus. And so the government stimulus is the CARES Act, the Corona uh, Families First Act, uh, the IRS extending uh, payment deadlines and things like that. So originally we'd call it the CARES Act, but really there's been a fair amount of government stimulus. That also includes the Federal Reserve actions. And these have all been very profound and very impactful. And so that's the second part of the deck. And then the third part of the deck is I wanted to review the SECURE Act because the ink is barely dry on the SECURE Act. It was passed at the end of December. That has a profound effect on clients who are trying to pass wealth on through their IRAs, okay? So it has a profound effect on retirement accounts. And yet, you know, we were barely 
done trying to educate people on that, trying to um, incorporate strategies as to how to approach uh, those things that were baked into the SECURE Act. And then we round the corner and all of this happened. And so my concern is that people are forgetting about the SECURE Act, about trying to pass on wealth with large IRAs, about tax issues, because we're getting so caught up in the moment here. And I wanted us to sort of round the corner and refocus on some of those issues. And so any one of these items could literally <clears throat> take hours, could justify an entire deck on its own and does. I mean, I have a separate deck for all of these things. And basically what I did is I pick and chose um, the highlights, highlights from each of those three decks to make what I'm calling the Uber deck. Having said that, I can talk about any of these things for as long as I need to talk about them. And so one of the things we're going to do is we're going to start off with a poll to um, see what the things are that folks are most interested in. And that is what I'm going to focus most on. And so the poll um, it says here, the polls must be closed to enable screen sharing. So I'm not sure um, if that's something on us. But Ryan, I want you to distribute then the first question on the poll. Um, and it says poll in progress, and you have a minute to answer the poll, so folks can answer the poll. Um, and right now, I don't see anyone having voted yet, so do folks know? Oh, okay, I see voting, so that's good. So you folks have about a minute to vote on what you'd like. And so as you're voting, you know, when I do the workshops, when I'm sitting with a client, I'm able to poll the crowd or, you know, ask the clients, what do you want to talk about today? What's on your mind? What keeps you up at night? And I ask that every time I do a workshop as well. And then I gear the workshop to whatever the people want because I want to give the people, you know, what they paid for essentially. Um, although my workshop attendees obviously come for free. And so I like to do that. And what's difficult, as you all know about these webinars, is that they can be very one-sided, which I do not like. And so um, now we've got this polling, which is very cool because it's your way of communicating with me. One of the things that Ryan, um, uh, Alexis also mentioned is that you can um, send questions to my email, dtaylor at taylorfinancialgroup.com. And at the end, I will answer the questions. My compliance department is not allowing chat a chat function during um, the webinar, unfortunately. And so you've got to send me the email because that way they can track the questions you're asking. Okay, so we've got 65% of you having voted um, and we're definitely seeing some clear winners. It's interesting how you see the trend, right? Um, and so it looks to me like two thirds of you want to hear about the markets, the economy and investment tips. And then in second place is financial planning and retirement planning with almost half of you wanting to focus um, on that. And so that is very instructive. And so that's what we're gonna focus on. So we're going to spend more time on the markets, economy and the investment tips, and then also financial planning, retirement uh, planning tips. That was um, sort of my instinct is because I think there's been a fair amount of news and discussion on sort of like what's going on, like what's happening. And so to me, I wanted to get to the higher level of thinking, right? That next step is what do we do about this? What's our path forward? How should we be acting? How should we be designing portfolios? Um, how do we be saving taxes? You know, that sort of next level of thinking. And so the first two webinars, we focused a lot on what I would consider to be the basics. So for those of you who are, are like, gee, I have no idea what she's talking about, the CARES Act. I have no idea what she's talking about, the SECURE Act. You know, we have decks on that and we actually have the recordings from the past two webinars. If you don't know where to find them then just send us a quick email uh, send it to me send it to alexis and we will get that to you um and so by all means we want to understand the basics and today is going to be like a little bit of intermediate the deck is large enough that some of those basic issues are being addressed but we're not going to spend time on those slides we're going to move very very quickly through those slides but that content is still there okay so 65 percent of you voting markets economy investment financial planning retirement planning um are the are the winners. Just so you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't introduce here Rob Taylor, who is sitting next to me, but he is off camera. And so he will be like whispering in my ear every once in a while. So if I'm like going like this with my hand, um, that's either my pets or that's Rob. And I want to also bring my atten your attention to these um, beautiful barrettes that are in my hair. Um, this is here because I've not had a haircut in over two months. Um, and as a result, my hair grows this way. Um, it doesn't grow down. It grows this way, like Bozo the Clown, for those of you who remember Bozo the Clown. And so um, and so my daughters put these nice barrettes in my hair. Um, and, and hopefully that will make me a little more photogenic. All right, so then um, without further ado, I think I covered um, 
was most of the housekeeping. Um, and so, yes, let's hop in. Here's the disclosures. What are we going to talk about? And so um, we just discussed those three, um, those three items. And this is the poll that we just went through. So <clears throat> global economies and the markets. And so the market is um, obviously closed today, not so great, right? Market was down 3% today, um, but it was up 13% in April, down 3% today. What does that mean? Basically down 13% uh, year to date. The Dow Jones down 18% year to date. And the Nasdaq down 5% year to date because it took a big bit of a hit today, right? Yes. Um, and so, um, and so those are some of the quick data points to bring us, you know, completely up to date. So what do we have then? <clears throat> we have a market that fell <clears throat> 34% um, from the February 19th peak to the bottom, which was roughly about March 23rd. Okay, so it was about 23 days or so, um, you know, 30 days, 23 days. That was the quickest bear market that we've ever had in history okay and that's that algorithmic trading that we've talked about in the past was i think a big part of it okay then from the bottom where we were down 34 <clears> percent the market went up 27 percent um from that from that low okay and that was the strongest rally in 90 years so we had the quickest bear market ever and you know that was a decent bear market down 34 percent that's respectable bear market right a bear market is down 20 percent so that that was respectable right it's not like oh we were down 20 percent we barely made it right that was respectable down 34 percent but we you know um blinked our eyes um, and then we popped up and had the strongest rally in 90 years and that's where you saw that really astounding april um up uh 13 percent which was um the best april that we've had i have the data point for that but the best april we've had in you know many decades and i have that in the deck here okay so what are we seeing right very very extreme swings in the market and very extreme um volatility and so we're going to talk about you know where that's coming from and what we see for going forward okay but that's sort of the background of what we're coming into now mm. so we cannot hop into markets we can't hop into economy um, we've got to start at the beginning. I think it was Sound of Music, right? We've got to start at the beginning, that song, right? Um, we always, that was, that's Rob's favorite movie. We've got to start at the beginning. And the beginning is um, the coronavirus, right? Which is well-documented, right? Um, this week, over a million cases, one in five folks in New York infected, 3.3 um, million cases worldwide, 30,000 cases a day, over 60,000 deaths in the United States, which is one quarter of the global toll. And obviously in New York here, we're in the epicenter um, of that. So hard to get away from that, um, no matter how you cut it. Even if we weren't in New York, um, at the end of the day, this is a global pandemic. This is going to affect the farthest reaches um, of this economy, of the globe. And I think we are just beginning to see what that's going to look like. I think we are in the earliest chapters of this book. I'm not alone you know, in that thinking. So Johns Hopkins has obviously been in the forefront of um, you know, discussing best practices connected with the pandemic. They have some great resources on their website and here's the interactive um, map. And so we, um, you know, we continue to struggle again, particularly in the Northeast. So what are we talking about, right? These known, unknown, known unknowns, all this volatility, right? And then, you know, there's all these theories, right? Are increased temperatures going to help us, right? You know, all these theories, but here's the bottom line, right? Is we need three things. It's essentially a three-legged stool is how I would describe it. And we need some potent combination of these three things for, I believe, for volatility to subside and for things to get back to normal. And again, I would tell you that most of the things I'm saying are consensus views um, by folks who I consider to be very well respected and experts. I'm not an epidemiologist, but like all of us, um, we're all now armchair epidemiologists and armchair market technicians and everything else. And so, you know, this is my reading and interpretation of what I consider to be the best data and the best opinions out there is we need some potent, some reliable, some confidence-inducing combination of three things, right? We need accurate and widespread testing, okay? And not one or the other. We can have widespread testing. If it's not accurate, it's not worth a darn, okay? And we can have accurate testing, but if people can't get their hands on it, why does that matter? So we need accurate and widespread testing. We do not have that right now, okay? We need a vaccination. We do not have that right now. 
best thinking is that it will be 12 to 18 months for vaccination. Bill Gates was in The Economist last week, basically saying 12 to 18 months. Um, again, I think that's a consensus view, and he is considered very much an expert. He and Melinda have spent literally billions of dollars um, of their own um, family foundation money in trying to eradicate diseases um, like this. And he is not the only one, 12 to 18 months. Okay, something came out yesterday uh, predicting, or maybe this morning, predicting a vaccination um, in maybe like nine to 12 months. And that was really the first that I had read of that was this morning. Um, and so let's say nine to 12 months for a vaccination. That's probably the most optimistic, okay? All right, so the second leg is a vaccination. We got nine to 12 months for that. Um, our widespread and accurate testing, big question mark, right? Um, when that's going to happen, how that's going to happen, and then treatment. And so we see that Gilead has its treatment, um, and um, Dr. Fausti um, leaked the results of some of those, um, the tests of that treatment. So when I read about it, I was not nearly as excited as the market, because when you read about it, it cuts the um, release time from the hospital, from I think it was 14 days to 11 days. So it cuts four days off the release time from the hospital. The researchers considered that statistically significant because it was a third less time in the hospital. I think that's fair and statistically that's true. However, if you tell me that we've got this fantastic treatment and you will only stay in the hospital for 11 days versus 14 days, um, that's not getting me to a baseball game anytime soon, and that's not getting me to a rock concert, particularly if I'm in a high-risk category, which, by the way, uh, more than 20% of the population is in that high-risk category. Uh, folks that are 65 or over, folks that are diabetic, um, I would put myself in that high-risk category um, because I have a slightly depressed uh, immune system. And so I think if you look around, we've got at least a quarter of the folks that are in that high-risk category. And so to tell them, hey, we have a, quote, treatment, and that treatment will keep you in the hospital 11 days versus 14 days, I'm not gonna get excited about that. The other thing is that the treatment did not statistically significantly cut down on deaths. And so you basically had the same amount of deaths with the Gilead treatment as without the Gilead treatment. The difference was by like two or 3%, and Rob, correct me if I'm wrong, went from like 11% to 9% or something mm -hmm. to 8%. So it went from 11% deaths to 8% deaths, okay? This again, is not a number that's going to excite me, nor is this a number that's going to encourage me to go out and take unnecessary risks, okay? So the Gilead treatment, um, and we love Gilead as a company, um, and I don't mean that from an investment standpoint necessarily, so don't read into that. I mean, I truly honor um, those folks that are working night and day to try to save the world, and I have good friends that work at Gilead, and so I am very supportive of their efforts and the rest of the biotech and pharma industry, um, like go and rescue America 100%. But I am saying, as far as sort of a practical viewpoint, and whether this should be necessarily market moving or whether we should be opening up the economy and doing away with social distancing because we have a quote treatment that keeps us in the hospital for 11 days versus 14 days that does not st statistically significantly cut down on deaths. And by the way, the way that treatment works is an IB, okay? Now I have given birth to three children and I've had fairly intrusive uh, dental work um, in my almost 54 years, as most of you have also had dental work, right? Um, I can tell you, I consider getting an IV one of the most painful procedures that I've actually ever gone through. Um, I hate getting IVs and I've given birth to three children and I hate the IV. And so again, this is somewhat intrusive, 11 days in the hospital, um, I'm not signing up anywhere for that. And so that is right now um, one of the best, you know, publicized treatments that out there. I think I just read on my news feed that um, somehow the FDA or Trump is giving some preliminary approvals, fast tracking that. Emergency um, use. Emer emergency use. Of course they are, right? Because if we can get people out of hospitals in 11 days versus 14 days, that frees up beds, frees up staff, frees up, you know, a lot of things. So by all means, 11 days is a, a win over 14 days. And by all means, we need to use every resource at our disposal um, to free up these resources, get people well, 100%. But if we are thinking that this is some panacea that we're going to, you know, um, 
you know, alter our social distancing in some significant way, or that this should be absolutely 100% market changing behavior. Personally, you know, I, I don't see that. I still have a fair amount of skepticism. Um, I still want to see treatment. I still want to see vaccination. I still want to see testing. And again, some um, combination, some cocktail of those things to create the confidence. They are starting to open up economies out there and the data is coming in where folks are not going out as much. Um, folks are not you know, engaging because the confidence is not there for the reasons that I'm just saying is until we have widespread accessible ways to deal with the epidemic, you know, people are going to hold back in a lot of ways. And so that is, you know, my best thinking. And I do believe that until we have sort of some version of that trifecta, um, we need to be prepared for market volatility and for hindered confidence um, in the very least. And that's going to affect then a lot of things, right? Consumer spending, um, that will then affect um, corporate spending, GDP, right? There's all these knock-on effects. And, um, and I think we need to be prepared for those knock-on effects until we've got you know, some combination that is meaningful. And so folks are coming out, I think again, Dr. Fausti, um, and he's saying it's going to be a year or two, right? That was today um, in the papers, right? Yes. I don't know if you saw that. And he was saying it's going to be a year or two until things get back to normal. Um, and that's because we're going to need a vaccination um, for us to really go out and about with some measure of confidence. And again, that vaccination will have to be manufactured. If you've read anything about that, that is not an overnight process. You don't put something in a Petri dish and then come back the next morning. Um, and, and there's got to be some testing on that as well. And so this is far more nuanced and complex than I think um, the market is acknowledging um, and that regular folks are acknowledging. And, um, or maybe I'm just doing too much reading and I should just um, <laughs> just have a margarita or something on Friday afternoon instead of holding webinars. And so anyway, um, so those are some of our um, thinking. And so what's happening then? So this great recovery that we just saw for the month of April, and of course we gave back 3% of it today, right? Um, what is it banking on? And so JP Morgan, um, you know, their, their theory on this. And just so to be clear, not only am I, you know, basically reading night and day, and I'm reading the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, uh, Barron's, um, everything I get my hands on that's, you know, reliable. Um, but in addition, I'm sitting on several conference calls a week. And so um, I could literally sit on Goldman Sachs and JPM calls literally every single day. JPM has a daily market call now. And Goldman has calls probably four or five days um, during the course of the week, okay? And so that's just two um, of the sources of information as far as the banks and the calls. Um, and then I've also mentioned, I sit on with Dr. Jeremy Siegel, who is very well-respected Wharton professor, and he has a Monday call. And then there are a plethora of additional calls um, from folks and investment companies that you may not have heard of, but they are you know, very strong in certain boutique areas. So there is a fair amount of um, places that I'm getting the information from. So in the JPM call this week, it was interesting because basically what the market rebound in April might tell you or what some people are hoping for is a sort of V-shaped recovery, right? And um, we have slides on that near the end, but, um, and we go in a little more detail, but what a V-shaped recovery then is basically um, banking on are three things according to JPM, okay? One of them is that the government stimulus is going to be uh, very effective. And I will say the government stimulus has been unbelievable. I mean, that, you know, Jeremy Powell is just, you know, he is Johnny on the spot, okay? And so the, um, the V-shaped recovery is counting on that government stimulus basically being able to um, solve all of our problems or solve a lot of those problems, okay? Um, it's also counting on treatment, okay, being effective. Um, and it's also, um, counting on this, that this is, um, you know, this major economic news can be shrugged off. And so the V-shaped recovery is and that things are going to get back to normal quickly. That V-shaped recovery has then critical assumptions behind it that to me are not clear um, that those assumptions are going to uh, stand true and be confirmed. 
And so that, again, is where you don't see us pushing for some V-shaped recovery, and you don't see us buying completely into this April rebound, like it's going to stick, um, because some of the assumptions underlying the V-shaped recovery, uh, I think, could be somewhat faulty or overly optimistic. We're going to get into that in a little bit. Okay. So the economic shutdown, and obviously these slides have, you know, a fair amount of wording on them, but here's the bottom line from the IMF, okay, which was about two weeks ago. Quote, it is very likely that this year the global economy will experience its worst recession since the Great Depression. So this is coming from the IMF, um, and I don't think then there's any better way to say it, is what we're dealing with is very serious. They are predicting a 3 to 4% uh, decrease in global GDP um, in 2020. Um, Dr. Kelly from JPM calls it a stall and surge economy. And so GDP uh, for Q1 was reported this week down almost 5%. JPM is predicting Q2 GDP, GDP down to be 25%. But I am seeing predictions of Q2 GDP down anywhere from 30 to maybe even 40%, which would be, you know, really catastrophic and serious. And so 25% is basically the consensus prediction, according to the journal, uh, surveying a number of investment banks. 25% is sort of middle of the line. And I will admit 40% is a little bit on the extreme side. Um, but this gives you a picture of what we're preparing ourselves for. So remember Q, um, Q1 came in, but Q1 was fine um, all the way up until the last month. So we came in at minus 5% for Q1 GDP. That's based on one month because the first two months were fine. Um, and so we are really bracing for Q2, which is going to be um, very, very bad. It, it is the biggest quarterly contraction since 2009. Okay. So a couple of things here. First of all, we have never had so much divergence among the economists, um, probably ever. So the standard deviation between economists' forecasts are incredibly wide. So like I was saying, is that the JPM forecast is minus 25%, but some of the forecasts are going all the way up to 40%, right? You will see this incredible divergence of forecasting because economists are saying that their models were not designed to address this, which is why you see them updating their models literally intra-week. And so I was on a call with JPM this week. They're like, oh, we typically update this one model monthly. We are now updating this model you know, every week because the models um, weren't designed for moves that are this quick and all the data inputs that are happening and just how quickly things are changing. Um, and so that's, again, one of the, one of the challenges also uh, with what the economists are, are trying to do right now. Okay, so what has caused um, some of this GDP decline is obviously the social distancing is generating massive economic issues. And so instead of having, um, you know, a whole deck on this, uh, I have a slide where I highlighted what I consider to be, you know, the critical points. And so, um, again, this slide is less than a week old, and some of this data is already out of date. Um, we'll be updating it this weekend. So, we have 30 million um, initial unemployment claims because unemployment is reported on Thursdays. So that's 30 million. We have 3.8 million that filed for last week. The good news is that um, it is actually decreasing a little bit. We think we've seen the peak in unemployment claims. So that is the good news. We do believe that the 30 million though may underreport slightly because the state systems are so out of date that they're not able to process these claims and take them in. And so the um, unemployment may be actually underreported. We have then predictions for unemployment in the mid to high teens. Anywhere from 10 to 20% are the predictions for unemployment um, going forward is what we're going to see, okay? Biggest contraction since 2008. So that's the other thing you see with these data figures is virtually every data point we have is followed by biggest contraction since 08, biggest contraction since 09, and then some of them are biggest whatever, decline, whatever, since the Great Depression. And so you see a lot of data points and the comparisons are to periods that um, 
represented real struggles for our economy and our stock market and for people. Okay, so um, consumer spending was down almost 8% in Q1. That is the worst since 1959. Savings has gone through the roof. I think I saw a data point today that savings is up to 13%. People are starting to hoard money. Even people who are um, employed and making money are nervous. They're going to lose their jobs. Their business is going to struggle, what have you. And so we're starting to hoard money. Again, not good signs for the economy, but consumer spending already in Q1. And remember, the first part of Q1 was just fine. We were hitting a market record in the first part of Q1. It's already down 8%, worse since 1959. Restaurants and hotels for Q1 down 30%. That is just the beginning. Q2 is going to be a disaster. And so that's where we see then Q2 numbers anywhere from minus 25 to minus 40% is the latest prediction. What other uh, interesting data points we have here is the Congressional Budget Office, which is supposed to be nonpartisan, okay? And they are expecting unemployment to surge to 14% in the second quarter um, and to stay elevated. And again, I see numbers up to maybe 20% unemployment. Um, and we see then um, other retail traffic down 98% year over year and um, tumbling fuel and oil demand. That's a real issue. And it's not an issue just for Texas or for Oklahoma. What the oil and energy markets are telling us is that they are worried about demand, okay? They are worried about the economy and you see that prices decreasing. So that is another signal to us um, on one level. And then the other level is a fair amount of the economy relies upon a strong oil and energy market. And so it's not just like, oh, you know, that stinks for the energy companies. There are tremendous knock-on effects, high yield debt. A lot of it's connected with the energy industry. Um, many states, their um, output is very closely connected to energy. And so it's not, it, when you have such extreme, um, extreme, courses of events, you always have to think about the knock-on effects, um, the second level, the third level, and some of it can be actually very unpredictable. For example, if we've got problems in the energy sector, and then we've got um, places in Texas, you know, floating bonds, um, or Oklahoma or wherever, you've got to then worry, are we going to have issues with the municipal bond market? And then if we have issues in a specific state, um, with their municipal bonds, is that going to have knock-on effects with other municipal bonds in other states and counties or municipalities? Because then there's some panic within the municipal bond a market, which is 78% retail driven, and the retail investors have a tendency to panic and overreact. And so sometimes it's not just the thing, it's the thing and the thing and the thing after the thing that makes you a little bit nervous and makes you watch this um, very closely. All right, so let's talk about the S&P 500, right? Which is really, you know, the standard index. So I don't get so excited when I see the S&P 500 go up um, because I wanted to know what's making the S&P 500 go up. And one of the things we've seen is that 25% of the S&P 500 value now is being driven by five companies, okay, five stocks. And so the S&P 500 is really being driven by these five companies. And we saw even today and yesterday is that when some of those top companies struggle, um, it creates you know, a, a reverberation throughout the, less, um, the, the remaining of the index because it's really what's driving the index, okay? Um, the other thing that we're seeing is if you strip out the S&P, out of the S&P 500, if you strip out those five technology, mega technology companies, the average, the median stock in the index is trading 28% below its high. So what that's telling you is you've got these five companies, they are really driving this index because it's a market cap weighted index, and that many of these companies sort of beneath the surface are actually struggling and are 28% um, below their high and actually probably even uh, more off their high because this data was as of like two or three days ago um, and the market has gone down. And so this is something we need to look at. That's when they talk about the breadth of the market. And we want some market breadth to feel confident that the stocks are going to continue to perform um, and there's some stability here. And right now we don't have a lot of breadth. And so if you look at this chart a couple weeks ago, 
you had only about 10% of stocks trading above their 200 day moving average, which was very, very grim. Okay. Now you have close to 30%, 25 to 30% of stocks trading above their 200 day moving average. That is a little bit more encouraging, but if you look closely at the chart, um, you know, it's still at a very, very um, low number. And um, it's still something then that we're going to watch um, closely. Um, higher than the 2008 level lows, but again, nowhere close to an ideal level. Back in 2008, um, we were at like that 10 to 20% um, number. And again, very concerning if you're trying to um, sort of bet on a short-term market recovery. So the ECRI. So the ECRI is our in, um, index of weekly leading um, um, indicators, okay? Leading indicators. And so the stock market is actually considered a leading indicator. So are high yield bond spreads. And so this is um, an index that tracks these data points. Six of the seven um, recessions since 1967 were preceded by the ECRI going negative. And if you look here, um, the ECRI is at a worse level than 08 and 09, okay? And actually is worse than 2001. And so the ECRI then is flashing um, not a great signal. Um, and actually, we got news today, I think it was Wells Fargo, is no longer taking home equity line of credit applications. So, either is JPM. and either is JPM. So those of you who are clients and most of your clients, if you remember from meeting after meeting, if you folks don't mind, I'm going to take off my jacket. It is really hot right now. Um, we're in the part of the um, house where the sun is beating on it. And so I'm going to take off my jacket, if you don't mind. If I was in a meeting, you'd say, yes, Debbie, of course, take off your jacket. Yeah. Um, but now we're in this weird world where I can't see you nod your head and say, yes, Debbie, of course, right? Um, and so for those of you with, um, you know, want to say something else? Yeah, I just wanted to say something else. In the last couple of weeks, we have been able to get uh, you know, collateralized loans on people's non-retirement accounts set up here. So if it's something you're looking to do and you're getting knocked out of the HELOC market, come talk to us and we can do something potentially with your non-retirement accounts. They do not let you collateralize retirement accounts. Yeah, so that's a great point. And to be clear, we make not a penny, not directly, not indirectly, nothing. I mean, actually it's a ton of paperwork, but like Rob is saying, we can take your non-retirement account, non-retirement, and we can get what, 75%? Right now they've gone down actually to about 40 45%. Is that right? They were up to yeah. around okay. 60% in that, but they're very worried yeah. about market volatility. Yes, of course. Okay. So you can get about 40% and the credit, um, the um, interest is actually not bad, right? It's, it's a couple low, percent. It's low threes. Yeah. It's like 3%. Um, doesn't cost you anything, nothing. We make not a penny off of it. Um, but again, all about the plan B, all about having flexibility, all about having tools in your toolkit. Okay. So the ECRI is um, a little bit grim right now. And so to be clear, is the market has a tendency to start bouncing back when we see the equity start improving. So it doesn't have to be perfect, okay? But it needs to start improving. Um, I don't know how much worse the equity can be, um, but the equity is also based on mortgage applications and that's not going so well. It's based on initial jobless claims. That data point could start improving. High yield bond spreads have been staying around 800 basis points. At one point, they got to about 12% and they tightened, which is actually a good sign. Um, and so we, it's sort of a mixed bag on the equity, um, but these are very, uh, these are very grim. These are very grim numbers. So we need to watch this every single week, the equity. Um, and like I said, the market typically doesn't start improving until we see the equity improving. Okay. Bond spreads, we mentioned that. That's the canary in the coal mine. And we see here that our bond spreads were up at 12%. That was problematic. What happened? The Fed stepped in. We probably should answer many questions is why did this improve? How did this get better? The Fed stepped in. Uh, Jeremy Powell has like got a big like S on his chest. And now um, we've got, you know, eight or 900 basis points um, on the um, on the spreads, which are still, as you can see, highly elevated um, you know, so something to be watching. That is another leading uh, leading indicator. Okay, the credit guys are nervous Nellies, and so uh, you always want to talk to them first. They're the ones that predicted the Lehman bust. Um, they were well ahead of all of this. Okay, why are the stimulus for small business? And so in the last financial crisis, you know, I don't think they 
really were as concerned about small businesses. Um, they were more focused on bailing out the banks and things like that. And we can argue whether that was necessary. We're not going to do that today. Um, but what we do know is that small businesses account for 47% of the labor market and 44% of the GDP. And so small businesses don't get that attention, so to speak, right? It's all about like the big companies and the big corporations. But at the end of the day, it's small businesses like Taylor Financial Group, um, your local restaurants, um, those folks are carrying half the economy on their back and 50% of small businesses cannot survive more than three months with no sales. And so we are halfway through that period, hence the PPP, um, trying to get money out to those small businesses. Obviously, lots of news and politicization of that um, because businesses went in and took $20 million and uh, arguably they had access to credit markets and um, and and um, selling bonds and things like that. Um, but at the end of the day, this is why you're seeing the stimulus for the small businesses. I have very grave concerns about what is going to happen to these small businesses that are shut down. I do not think this is like um, flicking a switch. This is a very compounded, um, nuanced issue that's not going to happen so easy. Some of these businesses that are trying to get back to normal now, can't even though social distances is being lifted because the unemployment checks, um, half of the people getting unemployment checks are actually doing better on unemployment than in their jobs. And so some of these businesses are trying to call back their employees and their employees are saying no, because I'm making more money on state unemployment coupled with the federal um, relief, the pandemic relief fund, okay, they're making potentially up to about $52,000 a year, about $1,200 a, um, a week or so. They're doing actually better than on this state and federal packages put together than if they came back and worked for you in retail, in restaurant, as a cook, as a host, right? Think about well, as a landscaper, groundskeeper, and they're doing better at their $50,000 a year potentially and sitting home and being safe and not putting themselves in jeopardy or their family in jeopardy. And so those folks are making very rational economic decisions. This is textbook 101. Um, I wouldn't go back to work either if I could make $50,000 a year sitting home and not jeopardizing myself or my family. And so this is a real challenge that they're having now. It's creating um, even more of a compound uh, uh, effect. So we've got a problem with the small businesses. I just need to move the screen um, to the side. Okay. And that's again, where you see some of that relief. One of the concerns, I need to move that away so I can see this big part of the screen. Just give us one second. I have a Cracker Jack AV team here. Um, yes. Excellent. My vision is not so great, so I need a big screen next to me to show me all my charts and my numbers, um, and, um, and that was getting covered. And so anyway, um, and so we've got some issues here with these uh, small businesses coming back. And again, now remember the knock-on effect. So let's take a very simple illustration. Let's say your local restaurant, okay? So let's say they go out of business and you're like, oh, that's sad, right? Okay, so now we've got the cooks, the waiters, and the host who are no longer working, okay? Um, and the chef, okay. Now you've also got the people that clean that restaurant. You've got the linen company that washes those linens. You've got the folks that manufacture and create those linens. You've got the food distributors that now have decreases. You've got the folks that transport the food, the truck drivers. Then you've got the folks that sell those trucks, that service those trucks, that provide gas for those trucks. Now they all get hurt, right? The knock on, now you've got the farmers who are growing the food, but no one's buying the food because people aren't going to their local restaurants as much, right? And then you've got the landlords who now are having to deal with either empties or major rent concessions. And so one of the things they're talking about is that April was not so bad for the landlords and real estate because people had enough money to get through April. And now they're saying the day of reckoning is here. It's May 1st. Um, and already large um, retailers like The Gap are renegotiating their lease, basically telling their landlords that we're not paying you this month um, or we want concessions. And a lot of these retailers are on the verge of filing for bankruptcy or already talking about their bankruptcy applications. And so um, this is this is a knock-on effect. Um, and oh, and then the banks that hold the loans, 
Right. And now the banks that hold those loans and now they have non-performing loans. And so these are the things that we're going to be seeing over. Yeah. Duh. Right. The banks. These are the things we're going to be seeing over the next like 60 to 120 days. And so it's so much beyond your local restaurant going out. I I mean, I wish that was the, the whole challenge there. It is so much beyond that. And these are the things that are, are going to unfold over the next couple of months. And we're going to have to see, which is why, of course, they did this PPP. But we saw in today's news, they're acknowledging that the PPP is not enough. So one of the things we're seeing is um, for folks, particularly, let's say, in the Northeast, that have high rent, but perhaps their payroll is not so large. So, for example, if you're a restaurant, if you're a salon, and maybe you're in the Northeast, you're in New York, you're in a city, you're in Boston, you've got a huge rent but you don't have payroll, the PPP doesn't make a lot of sense for you. How are you being helped? And so the um, Fed just rolled out programs within the last 48 hours, additional small business relief that's not necessarily tied to payroll, um, but that's supposed to be a little bit more flexible. And so again, these are those knock-on effects. That's the second level of trying to address the problem that people didn't necessarily process the first time around or didn't get around to it. So this is the chart that shows you in every single state and this chart to me was absolutely fascinating. And so it was in the Times. And basically what this shows you is absent these bottom like eight or nine states, okay? You see that line going down. If you are on the left side of that line, um, you are better off going to work if you're on the left side of that line. Unfortunately, there's only like eight or nine states on the left side of that line, and all the others are on the right side of that line, which means it's better that you stay home, okay? And what this means, what? Some of them are significantly. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, and some of them, right, it's not even close. All right, and that's a good point, is the ones that are on the left side of the line are barely on the left side of the line. So if you say to me, look, Debbie, you go back to work and make $52,000 this year, or you can stay home and make $51,000, um, I mean, some people are going to go back to work because they're like super hardworking and they love their job and they need that extra thousand dollars. But I think a lot of people are going to be like, hey, you know something for a thousand dollars? I'm going to sit this one out. OK, and not put my family in jeopardy. And so these folks on the left side of the line are barely on the left side of the line. And where are they? They're actually in the high cost of living states. It was interesting to look at this. Right. The states that cost a little bit more to live in. So the wages and the salaries are a little bit higher. Um, generally speaking, and I think that's why you see some of them on the left side of the line. So New York is there, Illinois, Massachusetts is there, um, but you still see, interestingly enough, New Hampshire is there. Um, I, you know, I have no idea why New Hampshire is there. That's obviously a low rent district, so to speak, right? And then West Virginia, I have no idea what they're doing in West Virginia, um, that you are better off going to work than staying home. So I don't know all the ins and outs. Um, but anyway, you see generally the higher, you know, the, the higher rent, higher cost of living places um, are the ones that had the higher wages and arguably could be better off going to work. But again, not so significantly that there's going to be this huge movement back to work, except in August, right? Because the unemployment runs out in August, and that's when then these people at some level are going to need to go back to work. I have no idea what happens between now and August. That seems like an eternity away. That's when the federal benefits run out, that extra $600 a week. Um, I have no idea how these businesses are supposed to manage, um, you know, how this is all supposed to play out. Obviously, the businesses can... Um, they can call you back, and if you don't go back, then technically it's abandonment and you wouldn't get unemployment. And then, of course, there's all kinds of issues connected with that. So we'll have to see how that plays out. We talked about the market retracing quickly. It's unbelievable. It's already five after five. I mean, this is unbelievable, this stuff. I know my husband's saying you've got to move this along. Um, I hope you guys find this half as interesting as I find this. I just think that this is fascinating, but we have so much we've got to cover here. Um, and so um, we say the S&P 500 now is trading at as of earlier this week, a 19 to 20 PE ratio, which is super high, okay? A 19 to 20 PE ratio based on um, you know, future earnings, which of course we're not getting great guidance for. And so um, you know, we don't have great earnings forecasts. Um, so again, this quick recovery um, leaves us a little bit dubious. Okay, here's the three kinds of bear markets. We did review this in the last deck, um, but I do think it bears a little bit of repeating is I think we started out as an event driven bear market. That's the bottom. That's the V, right? Something happens. Not so great. We got a quick recession. We bounced back because we solved the thing, right? We solved the thing. Okay. The problem is that sometimes the thing becomes another thing and another thing, and then it becomes a structural bear market. And those hang around a little bit longer. My fear now for a while 
is that the event-driven bear market, which is your nice V-shaped recovery, has evolved or devolved into a structural bear market. And our bear market stay with us a little bit longer because it's not just a thing, it's now many things, okay? And so this is our issue and you see the data there um, and that is it hanging around with us a little bit longer. And then when you have the health experts saying that this could be with us for another year or two, and actually I think Dr. Fauci said two years, okay? Um, you sort of see where it's not just a thing anymore, right? It's not just a thing. Okay, markets- Well, it ceases to be an event. Yeah, it ceases to be an event, right? right. It becomes structural, right? Structural. Okay, so I know some of this sounds grim. Okay, at the end of the day, I love the equity markets. Okay, I love the equity markets. Um, the equity markets, they come back. Now, I'm not allowed to say like they always come back because compliance says, Debbie, you know, you really can't say that. And so, um, but we have data here. We have a chart. Okay, I, I'll show the compliance people the chart. The chart shows us that the equity markets bounce back. I am a huge believer in the equity markets. You see me being very data driven, okay? I wouldn't believe in the equity markets if I didn't have the data to support it. So here's what the lesson is is right now we've got rough sledding. That is our lesson. Am I buying into the V? No, I'd love to buy into the V, but I'm not buying into the V. I'm buying into a W. How's my W looking? I'm buying into a W or I'm buying into like a U, okay? But the V, oh, what's my V? I had a V. I forget what the V looks like. The V, <laughs> I think that's a tough letter right now, the V, okay? So a W, um, and actually, if you read Powell's comments um, earlier this week, he doesn't use the letter W, but he basically refers to economy with starts and stops. That's sounding a lot like a W to me, okay? And then Fausti up there saying this is going to be with us for up to two years. Again, sounding a little bit like a W or like a U, okay? So what did that mean for us? That means that we got to buckle up, okay? I wouldn't get too excited when the market goes up. I'm not like, yay, this is all over, okay? I wouldn't get too excited when Gilead or another company comes out with something that can work in certain instances, in certain ways, right? Um, I think we gotta just sort of calm down and be like, this is the new normal. Um, we're gonna get through this and we're gonna make money, okay? So here's our different types of markets. I think we talked about this. My vote is on the L or U um, or the W is my vote, okay? Um, the Y is actually actually a depressing one, and the V is the most optimistic. I'm a little bit in the middle there. Maybe next time we'll do a poll is what types of markets um, you see, um, what, what types you see. I think I have to set up the polls in advance. Okay, here is our reminder that the S&P 500 outperforms um, basically all other investments, except here they had gold and REIT. Um, let me tell you, I have never been so happy not to be in real estate in my life. And again, I come from a real estate family. Um, I have never been so happy not to own commercial real estate. I don't, every day I say, oh, thank God I'm not in real estate right now. I'd be absolutely petrified. Um, and so anyway, if, if we are smart, the money is made and lost at market tops and market bottoms. So if we're smart and we don't do anything stupid, we're going to make money. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Okay. So let's talk about some of the investment opportunities. So Liz Ann Saunders from Charles Schwab, I have a lot of respect for her. She's very thoughtful. Um, and she's talking about then moving forward, some of the things that we could see. And so decrease globalization as distrust of China grows. Some people are like, yes, America first, right? All the manufacturing is going to move back to America. Not necessarily. It's probably going to move out of China because we can't completely trust them, but it doesn't mean 100% is going to come back to America. It may go to Mexico. It may go to some other places. Um, America is definitely going to be a winner here. Um, it's definitely going to be a winner, but it's not like winner takes all 100%, okay? We've got to... Um, reinforce those supply chains. We've got to make them more secure. Um, the uh, military has been complaining for years that the anthrax vaccination, a critical component, was only manufactured in China. How do you say that that's okay? I have no idea. Um, those things that were okay before are not going to be okay going forward. And I think that's actually a good thing for us. It could drive up costs a little bit, okay? Because the reason that China won is China was cheap right? Now we might have to spend a little more money either manufacturing domestically or in other places that are not, are not as cheap. So things might become a little more expensive, okay? Increased caution in daily life. We see the savings rate is now the highest that it's been, um, I think I think it was since 1960s or whatever, okay, in decades. You're going to see folks 
businesses, individuals, they're not going to spend, they're not going to go out, they're going to become more cautious. That is going to create a drag on GDP. Um, and so I think we need to be prepared for that more caution. Okay. So that's on um, the left side. And then on the right side is some of the investment things. And so we're going to talk about that. Are you writing another note for me? I like my little notes, right? Is great depression mentality. Um, okay, so that's really encouraging. Um, okay. <laughs> what I mean by that is you've had parents or grandparents that went through the Great Depression. It's something that stayed with them for their entire lives. And mm -hmm. I think for a lot of people, this is going to be something that stays with them for their entire lives. And they're going to be much more cautious as they move forward. Fair enough. Very good. Um, so that's very good. Okay. So, um, all right. So then let's then go through and talk about some of the investments. So on the right side, right, is where do we see for some of the investments? So high quality companies with strong balance sheets that are immune to recessionary forces. So we just set out scenarios where things might not get back to um, back to normal so quickly. So what do you need? You need liquidity. You need a strong balance sheet for all of that to get through these tough times. Um, don't try accessing the um, the credit market so quickly. Um, don't try to borrow because some of that's not going to go through. So you need a strong balance sheet. And those are the companies that might do well. Consumer staples, right? Things we can't live without. And so it's interesting because for years, um, Procter & Gamble and some of those other companies were struggling. Now those companies are the winners. The pantry products is what we're calling them. Um, and those are doing well because we need to eat and we're stockpiling, right? So... Okay. Um, so, and then technology, right? And particularly mega cap technology, but we're going to drill down on this a little bit. Okay. Um, we need to be careful of bonds due to their low yield. So this is where it's very difficult is we've got a little bit of a challenge with some of the equities, but then the bonds are not going to be returning. High quality bonds are not going to be returning anything great. Right. And high yield, there's a fair amount of risk connected with high yield. Um, and not that we're against that. And so we've got a challenge here because our equity markets um, could challenge, could struggle a little bit. And then our bond markets, we have no interest, uh, no interest rates, right? So what are we going to do there? International markets are actually interesting. So we use a Goldman Sachs manager in uh, many of your portfolios. This guy is a genius. Um, and I was at dinner with him a couple months ago. That's when you're allowed to go to dinner. I think it was actually one of my last dinners. Um, it's amazing that you didn't realize it at the time. Um, this guy's a genius, has 80% of his net worth um, invested in his fund, um, not 80% of his liquid net worth, which is like a little game that they play with um, the wording, 80% of his entire net worth invested in his fund. He has actually beaten the S&P 500 and he's an international manager. And so what is this telling you is active management can make a difference. So when we had beta plays, when we had a market that everything was going up, then buy cheap. Right, buy cheap because you don't need to pay extra for someone to help you to go up. You've got a market that's going up anyway. But when you have winners and losers, okay, when you have companies that are on the verge of filing for bankruptcy protection, and then you've got other companies that are growing tremendously, we've got winners and losers, we've got a divergence here. Why are we then buying index funds and buying into those losers? Right? Maybe this is a time for active management to actually start you know, earning their value. And so coming up, maybe we didn't care as much about the active management, but in rocky waters, maybe we don't wanna be on autopilot so much. And so what we're advocating then is a blend is the ETFs and the index investing still can make sense. We still want that um, allocations there because that can still be helpful. But then some of these active managers, particularly in fixed income, particularly in munis, um, and in foreign emerging markets, those active managers, as far as I'm concerned, they earn every single penny, the good ones. And so when clients come to me and they're like, we do not want active manager, you know, I get it. I'm reading all the same stuff you're reading. I'm reading the New York Times on weekends. Um, I'm reading Kiplinger several times a day. I'm reading Vanguard. I'm reading Morningstar. I mean, I am reading that stuff. I lecture on it. I write articles on it. I get it. Um, and maybe if you were just randomly picking out active managers, then maybe you should just do your index fund and just take that, take that passive approach. But if you can find some of these um, active managers that have these long-term records, um, they, they are worth their weight in gold. And we do think we have found some of them and they are in your portfolios. Moat is another example. Um, that's an ETF, but it has um, 
like a factor in active overlay. And Moat has been in the S&P 500 for every single time period, one year, three year, five year, 10 year, has beaten the S&P 500. But Moat costs 40 basis points and you can buy the S&P 500 at five basis points. I will pay any day of the week, 35 basis points for a manager ETF that is beat in the S&P 500 over the one year, three year, five year, 10 year, where do I sign up? And by the way, with less risk, okay? Yes, Rob. One of the things you also see with active management at these time periods is active managers can many times perform much better than the indices in these times of market dislocation volatility because they can pick the winners, they can pick the winning sectors, and they're not forced to carry stocks that they really don't want to stock to carry. That's right. The other thing I wanted to talk about was on the fixed income side, you know, we talked last week, last time about getting into the, uh, the bond damager fund by Lord Abbott. You know, they also have something, instead of just going high yield in ETFs, which is very dangerous uh, in some of these ETF strategies, because what we have seen is, uh, and uh, Jeffrey Gunlock from Double Line said this week, is there's an ETF from I, from BlackRock called, and they have great products, but this one is called LQD. It's the um, corporate bond fund. He said it's the most overvalued security out there, right? Because what's happening since the Fed has stepped in and is backing it, people are pushing money into it. And if you look back, we did an analysis on this, when the market actually went down, that fund went down 5% more, you know, absolute, than compared to an actively managed corporate bond fund. So the point being is that this is a very important time, it's not just in equity side, but in the fixed income side, to be picking good active managers. And we tend to shy away from ETFs on the fixed income side, unless you're talking about government securities or something like that that's very well liquid and very well understood yeah. because it, when you saw those market dislocations they got they overreacted. they overreacted to it and just by the way the studies show from morningstar that active management actually can beat out passive management um, with fixed income with munis um, in those two sectors so the studies do support active management in that area just in general overall um, good. All right. So then let's hop into the investment themes to consider. So I know that we're going over and my apologies because you all have a life um, and um, and I love um, I love doing this and talking to all of you about this. And so if you could stay with me and we'll try to end at 530. Um, and if people want to stay and ask questions and we'll stay and ask questions, but I'll try to sort of get through the content. And I apologize, there's just so much to talk about here. And so let's talk about investment themes to consider. And so JPM has some approaches that they talk about. Um, actually, Kramer had some approaches that he talks about, and I'm not like a huge Kramer fan. I think he's more for entertainment value, um, but I did like how he communicated this. And so we're talking here about um, these baskets. And so there's basically three baskets. There's the loser basket, um, which I didn't even put on the slide. You have the big firms with deep pockets, which we just talked about a little bit. And then we have adaptable companies that maintain business through the COVID-19. So we basically have three baskets, okay? We've got two versions of the winners that we have on our screen, and then we've got the losers, okay? Let's let's talk about um, the losers, okay? And when I say losers, I'm not saying that they're losers forever. If you want to be positive about it, you can say too early, um, too early, okay? But who's losing right now? Our materials, firms, because we have decreased demand. Industrials, because we have decreased shipping, decreased airline traffic, right? That's abysmal, okay? REITs have me nervous as hell. Yes, Rob. Or if you're a storage company in New York City, because the storage companies are almost filled okay. because everyone's moving out. Right, so you're some niche, you're yeah. some niche REIT, okay? Um, energy is obviously very challenged, okay? So those are clear losers, very ugly, whatever you're gonna call them. Um, you're gonna see a lot of dividend cuts um, you know, in those areas, um, decreasing demand. Okay, let's focus on the positive, right? So the themes is whenever you see um, dislocation, right? Whenever you see turbulence, it makes the strong stronger and the weak weaker, okay? The strong stronger and the weak weaker, and it accelerates trends. So the companies, the sectors that were already having trouble, the restaurants that were already having trouble, this is just gonna push them over the edge, okay? They were teetering, this is just gonna push them over the edge, okay? And the strong, the strong gets stronger. They've got those fortress balance sheets, they've got a concept that's working, and what they end up doing is pushing out the little guys, buying up the little guys, a dirt, cheap prices, whatever they need to do, grabbing market share, okay? So strong get stronger and the weak get weaker, okay? So the first basket, right? 
is firms that are big enough and deep pocketed enough to weather the economic impact. And we talked about that. And we want fortress balance sheets, right? Not folks that are using Q accounting tricks. And so that is starting to be revealed, um, you know, in the market and in the analyst reports, right? Um, and then um, we also want uh, technology, um, which is cloud-based and 5G is the uh, better technology. And so we saw today that some of the mega technology got hit a little bit. Um, I think there could have been a little bit of a run up with those technology firms, a little bit too much optimism. Um, and so I'm not surprised that they took a hit. I'm not like all panicked, um, but I'm not surprised that they took a hit. Um, but the technology, but particularly the cloud-based and the 5G, Rob has been talking about 5G forever. Uh, technology is really his area and the cloud-based, this is his background, this is his area. And so he's always been talking about this and tipping us um, to the those things. So what else do we want? Um, I just have some notes here, so bear with me. Also the winners is the stay at home products, okay? So the products that we need to stay at home um, and then the cloud base like we talked about. Um, let's continue. So big tech and cloud. What are some of those companies that are in that space? Now, to be clear, I'm not saying run out and buy those companies today. Um, I'm not saying that those companies, some of them might not be slightly overvalued. I'm just giving you examples of what we're talking about, okay? Examples. So big tech and cloud, okay? Um, all right, banks, big question mark on the banks is they're gonna have a lot of write downs. They're gonna have um, non-performing loans that are uh, being, showing up on their books, um, but they're gonna have a lot of additional activity. Big question mark as to what how that's gonna play out with the banks. Um, and then of course, concerned about hotels and B&Bs, but then there's an argument that higher end hotels might do well, because if you're gonna to have to go to a hotel, you wanna make sure a hotel is investing in cleaning and all of that type of stuff. So again, like not this, but maybe this. Um, so there's, again, it's a, it's a lot more nuanced than, oh, let me just you know buy this index, this sector, and let me just have this whole thing um, right up. So JPM basically saying we need three sleeves in our portfolios, okay? We need a protection sleeve. So that protection sleeve can be cash, it can be annuities, um, it could be pension, it could be short duration bonds, right? But we need a protection sleeve. They have never talked like this before. Um, they're very bullish as a lot of these investment banks are. They want a protection sleeve. And I will say that most of you have that protection sleeve, right? We have increased cash a little bit um, because we do think the market is going to give some back. When it does give back, we are going to move this in. We are going to buy up some of these things that we think have gotten beaten up. Um, but you need a protection sleeve, right? That's our rainy day fund. And we have talked to all of you about that. That's, you know, um, all this, the cash, the bonds, the short duration, all that, okay? Um, we need a risk and equity sleeve. So we are still believers in the equity market. We love the equity markets, right? You just have to be prepared for short-term turbulence in the equity markets. And so you still need that equity sleeve um, and then you need that uncorrelated bucket, okay? And so your uncorrelated bucket could be hedged equity. It could be gold. Um, it could be some of these other, um, even distressed debt, but something that is not correlated to equities and something that's not necessarily cor correlated to the fixed income, you know, the traditional fixed income market, okay? So we need three sleeves in our portfolios. We have always believed in these three sleeves. We got away from 60, 40 portfolios years ago. Um, so we've always believed in these and more and more now they are sort of coming um, into let's say mainstream, okay? The theme from JPM, if I could sum it up in two or three words, is quality with cyclicality. Quality, those are your fortress balance sheets, get through the recession, right? Quality um, with cyclicality, okay? And so that's what we're talking um, about going forward. And these are the types of investment managers and strategies um, that we're looking at. This is going to be a test of modern monetary theory like no other before. The economists, there's no consensus on this. We're gonna have to see if we're gonna have inflation. What I will tell you is taxes are going up. So number one takeaway, taxes are rising, okay? I have a chart, I don't think it's in here, um, but it, we have the lowest tax rate right now with the exception of only two periods of time, 1929 when the taxes were first passed for a couple of years. And also I think it was like 19, oh, I have the date, 1960s or seven, Anyway, there's a period of a couple years um, in the mid to late 1900s where taxes were this low, it was like three to five years. And then back in like 1929, 19, around there, late 1920s. Okay, other than that, we are at the lowest tax rate in a hundred years almost, okay? That's gotta send you a message, is highest um, deficits and debt since World War II, okay? Um, and 
um, lowest taxes in 100 years. Okay, so this is very obvious. And we've got the sunsetting of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act at the end of 2025, which creates a perfect opportunity to raise individual income tax rates if we don't do it sooner. Okay, so we've got to have taxes in the back of our mind. All right, so CARES Act, um, we have unemployment, paid sick and family leave. Remember, we've got extension of time until July 15th to pay our taxes, to file our taxes, and to pay estimates. Q1 and Q2 estimates are both um, postponed until July 15th. There was some confusion on that. They had to go back at a second time. Stimulus checks. If you haven't gotten your stimulus check, let us know because there's things that we can possibly do to help. Mortgage, rent, foreclosure, eviction relief, student loan relief. It is all there, particularly if it was federally underwritten. If it's a federal mortgage, federal student loan, some of this should be happening automatically. If it's not federal, there's still phone calls you can make to get forbearance and certain types of relief, but there's questions you have to ask so you don't get trapped up. So let me know if you're getting jammed up and I will work with you on that. Charitable giving incentives, um, RMDs, RMDs, stop RMDs. We reached out to all of you. We have a spreadsheet. The folks that didn't get back to us, we picked up the phone, we called you, we harassed you, we took care of that. No RMDs for this year. Instead, let's do those Roth conversions and we can do penalty-free IRA withdrawals and loans um, from retirement plans, all kinds of relief in that way. But again, don't go to these relief measures until you talk to us. So if you're getting jammed up, let's have that conversation. Let's go the, through our choices and I will help you pick the thing that makes the most sense for you um, to go. And of course, the PPP, this was a little chart of where those PPP loans went. Ironically, it went to the middle of the country. Um, I had a lot of theories about that and the studies came and my theories were correct. Those are community banks. Um, they weren't as affected, so more people were working and the places that arguably needed it most, which is New Jersey, New York, California, and we got the least amount. Anyway, payroll tax credit and deferral. Again, if you're running a small business, talk to me about this. There are a lot of options here. For some folks, the PPP doesn't make sense. If you don't have a big payroll, maybe payroll tax credits make more sense or deferment. So lots of options here. It's dizzying. Um, let me know if you're getting jammed up and we'll look at it. We have a checklist. It is one of the handouts here that is available to you. Um, this is just a truncated version, but we have the entire um, handout that I'm not sure if I can show it on the screen, but it's available to hear. Um, and also we can send it to you electronically um, of all the planning opportunities, the things we need to be thinking about. And again, this was a truncated version. It's a two page handout that we created about opportunities here. Okay, the SECURE Act, so we did that. And now we've got the four or five minutes the large IRA, and I have 83% of you saying yes, of course you have a large IRA, it's one of the reasons you're clients. So these are the 10 things we need to know about the SECURE Act. Bottom line is RMDs, um, RMDs don't start until age 72, and so that gives us more time for planning, more time for Roth conversions, okay, so that's a blessing, okay, um, and then a lot of this is for folks that are still um, working, again, any questions, talk to me about it, here is the biggie, right, inherited IRAs must be depleted within 10 years, this is it, this is the whole enchilada, this is how they're getting wealthy people who are trying to um, trying to pass money on to their heirs. So to be clear, the spouse, uh, we have how many minutes? Because my wife, uh, the spouse has, oh, I have, oh, on here it's 5.45, so I have, uh, I have um, seven minutes. Yeah. The spouse has the stretch still, okay? So the husband passes, leaves the IRA to the wife. Again, this is a very traditional example. Apologize, right? The wife has her entire life to withdraw that money. So that has not changed, okay? But when the wife tries to leave it, um, what's left over, leaves it to the children, they are limited to 10 years unless there is an exception. Um, and here are the exceptions here. If they're disabled, chronically ill, not more than 10 years younger than the decedent, or certain minor children, not grandchildren, not grandchildren, children, okay? Um, and then there's an exception even to that exception if they're in college to the age of 26, whatever. Yes, quickly. And also that cascade. So for example, if you get an inherited IRA, you have it for five years and something happens to you, the 10 years doesn't start again, they, That's right. Person only That's right. Is once that yet. 10 year starts um, click ticking, then whoever picks it up after you gets what's left over on the 10 years. Okay. This is their way because of getting you and taxing you because even though there's no estate tax anymore um, to speak of because there's an $11.5 million lifetime exemption. And if you have a couple, then it's actually almost $23 million. It's adjusted for inflation. A lot of states have done away with the estate tax. I think there's still about 20 states that have an estate tax. So you still need to be sensitive to that. Um, this is the way that they get you um, on it. So these are the five tax gotchas. So we're going to just back up here. Social Security is a tax torpedo, okay? Um, this is for lower income. They haven't adjusted since 1993. I'm not so worried about that. Most of our clients exceed that. Medicare Irma surcharges, this gets triggered 
Um, when you are taking that IRA, you're the surviving spouse, you've got large taxable income because you're taking this money. Now it triggers your IRMA surcharges. That's a gotcha. Your net investment income tax is 3.8%. Um, this is another gotcha. It's not on your tax rate tables. It's something that gets baked in there afterwards. And the widow's penalty. This every single person needs to be paying attention to. If you're married filing joint and you're like, Deb, we're good. We're 22%. We're 24%. Why are you always complaining about this, right? Remember a couple of things. First of all, Tax Cut and Jobs Act ended 2025. 22 and 24% tax brackets are probably going to go away. But also remember, one of you is going to pass and there will be a widow. And that widow will basically have 90% percent of the income okay but she's going to be taxed as a single which is half the tax bracket so now all of a sudden married filing joint at one hundred ninety thousand dollars, your taxes are twenty four thousand dollars a year if you're the widow now your taxes will jump to thirty five thousand dollars and an additional five thousand dollars in those medicare irma surcharges so now you're the widow and you're paying taxes at forty thousand dollars instead of twenty five thousand dollars so do not be um, complacent about this, um, and this is under our current tax tables, not the Tax Cut and Jobs Act um, sunsetting in 2025, where they will undoubtedly be increasing and going after you. So taxes are going to basically double on some of those couples when one of them passes. And this is where, again, that large IRA, we've got to do distribution planning, do those Roth conversions, drive down those large IRA balances. We've got to drive them down because those tax gotchas, they get you eventually. If you've got money and you're not planning, they're going to get you. It's like that Blondie song from like when I was a kid, get you, got it, whatever, right? Is they're going to get you. So if they don't get the surviving spouse, Okay, they're going to get the heirs. So now she leaves the $2 million IRA to the kids. They've got to pull it out over 10 years. That is a 50% tax. When you factor in the federal tax and then a state tax, when I say a state, right? S-T-A-T-E, not S-state, state, right? When you factor in federal and state, okay, that's going to be 45 to 50%. So that $2 million IRA that you thought you were passing, that's not going to be a $2 million IRA by the time you're through. It's going to be a $1 million IRA. But there are things that we can do about that. How are we doing on time? we got three minutes. All right, I'm holding them through that 545, okay? So here are the solutions and planning opportunities. Is we've got to reevaluate beneficiaries on inherited IRAs, okay? We were going to leave it to Susie. The Susie was going to get that IRA, and then Jimmy was going to get the house. No, we're not going to do that. Susie and Jimmy get the house because they can split up that IRA, keeps them in the lower tax brackets, and then we'll figure out something on the house, okay? And so we've got to be smart about our beneficiaries, okay? We have to embrace, um, engage in active tax bracket management. So that means now while you're alive, okay, let's figure this out. Let's do distribution planning. Let's draw down those traditional IRAs. Let's do Roth conversion. So in a year that the market's down, right, the market's still down 13%. I think it's going to go down more, but let's do Roth conversions. If you're like, oh, Debbie, you say it's going to go down more. Well, maybe we do a small Roth conversion now, and maybe we do a bigger one when the market goes down. I'm telling you right now, I eat my own cooking. When this market goes down, the tailors are going to be doing a Roth conversion, okay? We already did a bunch of Roth conversions 10 years ago during the first uh, huge bear market. We did Roth conversion. Um, we will do another Roth conversion. I'm just waiting for that market to go down a little bit more, okay? So let's let's think about pulling down those traditional IRA balances. That's your bottom line. That's kryptonite. You have a large traditional IRA balance. You have got a problem. If you don't have a problem, your spouse is going to have a problem. And if your spouse doesn't have a problem when you pass, then your children will have a problem. And so you've got to be thinking around the road, the corners. Yes, we've got a question. We've got one minute. Oh, my if God. Do, if you want to look at Roth conversions, you got to start looking at it now. Don't wait for the market to go down. We have to be yeah, all we have set to have them run to go. Yeah, yeah, we got so to have the paperwork. We want to hit this. Yep, yep, we yep. hit it. Okay. We got to consider life insurance, not because I'm trying to sell life insurance. It is an option, okay? Charitable remainder trust, if you're charitably inclined, again, not my first choice, but again, there are options there. And then post-mortem tax planning with your beneficiaries is if you don't do all this planning or you do some of it, um, but you pass too early, which is where the life insurance could come in, then we will sit with your beneficiaries because there is tax planning we can do in that 10-year period to help them. But I don't want it to get to that point. I don't want to sit with your beneficiaries um, where we got jammed up, okay? I want to take care of this now with you okay so those are the six what are the factors that help you identify is there any way we can beat go to meeting i mean why can't we go over i mean what like don't there's I pay for this 50 program? 50 shot that you could go over like there's a 50 all right all right i mean look at us rolling the dice here here are the folks that um are at quote at risk okay large traditional ira bounce but remember it doesn't have to be one million dollars see i'm talking really quickly because they might just cut me off in like two seconds um it doesn't have to be 
um, $1 million. Maybe you're in your 50s and you have a $700,000 balance. That $700,000 balance is going to grow. You're putting money into it, whatever. So we've got to deal with it if it's a million or if it could grow to a million. And that's after-tax contributions. That's Roth 401ks. We model that out. It is excruciating work. It's very detailed work, but we model it out because we're so passionate about it. And we know that this is the right thing to do. I lecture on it. I speak on it nationally. Of course, I'm going to do it for my clients. If you have potentially large IRA balances, widows with large traditional IRA balances, that makes Makes me lose my mind because I'm worried, obviously. And then if the primary or contingent IRA beneficiary is a trust, we must deal with that. And those estate planning attorneys are asleep on the job. They are not being proactive. Um, and so we're the ones reaching out, starting this conversation. You can it, go over. Yes, I can go over. Yes. Oh my gosh. This is like crazy. <laughs> okay. Breathe. Okay. okay. All right. So, and by the way, nobody, nobody has hung up. You guys are incredible. Okay. All right. So all right, we only have two or three slides left. I mean, we are covering it, believe it or not. Okay. okay, so the four phases of the life cycle, we created this. This is a way for you to think about it. Is wealth accumulation is during the early stages, this was about building wealth, right? So this was keeping it simple, keeping it low cost, you know, I don't need professional help. I can be self-directed. And as long as you live within your means, you can build wealth. I think it was Warren Buffett said, it's simple, but it's not easy, right? Live within your means, keep it low cost, particularly last um, 10 years, right? Um, longest bull market in history. Just ride that wave up, right? Just ride that wave up. They do studies of monkeys and monkeys make um, a ton of money in bull markets, okay? This is not hard. What it did is created a false sense of complacency and a false sense of confidence in many folks, okay? Obviously, that's changing now. So that's wealth accumulation. That's the easy part. Then wealth preservation starts getting a little more challenging. We're going to retire. Um, we don't want as much risk in our portfolios, right? And so this is where then professional guidance can make sense. This is where JPM talks about those three sleeves where you want protection, you want non-correlated assets, right? This is where you maybe start mixing it up a little bit, right? You want what they call um, guaranteed income or safe income, right? That could be 30 to 50% of your portfolio, including like social security, pension, um, you know, bonds, annuities, things like that, okay? And then it starts getting hard. Wealth decumulation, right? That's the distribution planning and wealth transfer. And this is where you need to be creative. This is where professional guidance starts um, making a huge difference. And this is where if you try to do too much of this on your own, you are likely to misstep because it is so technical. And so this year, we received um, uh, this year, this week, we received a letter from an estate planning attorney um, um, on behalf of a client of ours. This was an estate planning attorney that I've literally been harassing for the past, I don't know, six months, maybe um, harassing because this client needs their estate plan updated. I offered suggestions to the estate planning attorney as to things that I wanted us to address. This client also had trusts as beneficiaries, which is a huge no-no. Um, and it took us literally four or five months of chasing down this attorney. This work is so complicated that finally, after five months, I got the email, okay? And it's complicated, but it shouldn't take the attorney five months. I got the email. Oh, my husband's saying I shouldn't be bashing the attorney so much. Okay. And <laughs> I finally got the email, okay? But having said that, the work is complicated enough that I had to read the email several times. And one of the things I'm going to be doing this weekend is basically outlining the email, outlining the strategies, um, because this is work that you need professionals to do. This is not the type of work that you can wing it. What does that mean? It means a lot of folks can't do it. Um, most folks can't do it and they can't do it. So they don't talk about it. Um, they're not bringing it to your attention because they can't do it. They won't do it. They don't have the team. Um, it's a whole space unto itself, which brings me to the three lane highway, which I also created this piece. And so the left lane is investment management. And up until about a month and a half ago, that was the easy lane. It's very crowded, that lane, and a very easy lane to be in, okay? Then you've got retirement and financial planning. And we are big believers that everybody should have a plan, okay? And so all of our valued clients have plans. Um, we believe that's our roadmap. The plans took into account that we'd have a bear market, that we have recessions. Um, we're updating plans for people. And so we're happy to update your plan. We are going along and proactively reaching out. But if there's something going on, by all means, reach out and we'll put you to the top of the list. Um, but everybody should have a plan. OK, and we do that as well. And a lot of advisors still don't do that. Um, because again, it's not scalable work, it's technical work, it's difficult work. 
um, and they don't want to be bothered. The right lane is tax management and retirement distribution planning. And this is a increasingly sparsely populated lane. Very few people in this lane. This is the hardest lane to be in. This is the lane that we're in. This is the lane that's required to do the type of work that we're talking about here. Um, the distribution planning, driving down those IRAs. There's a fair amount of modeling that goes into it, a lot of back and forth. I need your tax returns to do it, all kinds of stuff. And those of you who have been through it realize that it's not black and white. Um, there's a lot of gray area. And so there's a lot of um, collaboration that goes into it. But it's very valuable work because we know that we're making a difference, not just for you, but for your spouse and your family and your heirs. It's true generational planning. And that to me is some of the most rewarding work that we can do. And so um, so I wanted to talk to you, you know, a little bit about, um, about that. Coco is here next to me saying, you know, mommy, it's the time for you to be wrapping up. And so do we have any questions before we um, wrap up and thank people? I'm just going through my notes here. There was one question that came up is, is there a list of what qualifies as, a, as, a chronic, as chronically ill? Yeah, these are great questions. And so they don't want to make it easy for us um, to um, have that stretch IRA. Okay, the whole point of the SECURE Act, do you see, oh, there's Coco, she's on the camera. Right? If you hold your head up higher, people will be able to see you. See, there's my Coco, okay? She's Italian sheepdog. She's from Bergamo, which actually was very sad because we know Bergamo had a lot of issues over the last couple of months. It was actually very sad because her cousins live there. Um, and so anyway, um, they do not want you to have that stretch IRA. So let me be clear about this. And so those exceptions, those five exceptions that I mentioned, um, the spouse, I mean, obviously it's very black and white, 10 years younger, um, that's very black and white, right? But chronically ill and disabled, there is a very strict IRS definition, code definition for you to meet that. And it's gotta be chronically, um, chronically ill, chronically disabled, um, very strict definitions. So if you think that one of your beneficiaries could qualify um, and participate in that stretch, this is then something we should talk about to make sure that the beneficiary qualifies because um, if they do, then there's one type of planning that we would engage in, but if they don't, then there's another type of planning that we would engage in. Okay, so that's a great question. To be clear, the IRS does not want you stretching that IRA. Okay, they want you taking that IRA out now to pay taxes on it, or they want your heirs taking it out and paying taxes at elevated levels because your IRAs are gonna have to compress the distributions into 10 years, which is gonna force them into higher tax brackets, particularly after the Tax Cut and um, Jobs Act uh, does away with these lower, um, lower tax rates. So that's where also lower tax years um, create opportunities for us to either do Roth conversions or actually even to just take additional funds out of our IRAs um, because the idea here is to drive down those traditional IRA balances in a responsible way so that we're not leaving large messes to other people. I mean, that's really the truth of it. And actually, that's where the life insurance comes in as well, is that you can buy the life insurance to replace the value of the IRA lost to taxes or to pay the taxes. And so that's where you see the um, life insurance. Yeah, so we have another question. Well, this is a just to bring up the point is this is where this year the CARES Act and Secure Act really have a synergistic relationship because of the CARES Act, you don't have to take your RMDs this year. 100%. So if you're already taking RMDs, you're like, oh, trying to do a Roth conversion, I'm also getting right. with RMDs. Huge. It's a good opportunity. Right. We've reached out to a lot of you on this yeah. to take advantage of that. Yes. And there's been a ton of messaging around that. Um, our weekly newsletter, our client announcements. Um, we've had a ton of outreach on that. And so it is, it's a huge opportunity is when the market goes down and when it feels the worst, that's when you want to engage in these strategies. So that's where there's a little bit of the dichotomy is like your heart um, and your emotions are saying, gosh, I want to hunker down. I don't want to do gifting. Um, I don't want to do this estate planning. I don't want to do this Roth conversion because I'm worried about cash flow. That is when you need to be strongest, right? I don't want to buy into these companies, right? So we're going to be reaching out to you when the market goes down another 10%. And we're going to say, time to increase equities. When it feels the worst for you, that's when you should be doing the thing. Not when it feels good. When it feels good, that means that in many instances that it's too late. You're not taking advantage of the opportunities the way you should. So when you have that knot in your stomach, that's when we should be doing the Roth conversions um, and some of these other strategies we're talking about. Any other questions? No other questions. Okay, 
You have been the most amazing clients in the world. We're going to have some fun. We're going to do some virtual wine tasting, rum tasting, um, cooking class. I want something with alcohol because I think people like alcohol. Um, but obviously there's um, some complicating effects of that. There's tequila tasting and rum tasting, but I'm not sure how many people would do tequila tasting versus wine. Um, and so I'm sort of just trying to figure this out. If any of you have any feedback, please send me an email um, because some of it's easier to do than other. Like tequila tasting is easier than wine tasting. Um, so if you're like, hey, Deb, we do tequila tasting, then let me know because that one I could like put into effect right away. Wine tasting is getting a little bit complicated. Um, and so I got to figure that out. So please, any feedback, topics that you want covered, um, days or times of the week that it's better to do these. Look at Coco. She's like, come on. Um, wine tasting, tequila tasting, anything, please send us emails, send us feedback. Um, we want to make you happy. It is a privilege to serve you. We want to make a difference for you and your family. So anything that we can do for you, please let us know. Um, that's what Honestly, that's what I get the most satisfaction from. Okay. So on that note, thank you to everybody. Enjoy the weekend. God bless you. Stay healthy, stay safe, take precautions, and please let us know how we can help you. Okay. And thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks for your patience. Bye. Mm -hmm.